Welcome, students. Welcome, students. I'm sure we're all going to be very good friends. <laughs> you know, deep down, you deserve to be punished, don't you, Mr. Potter? I admit I've been both vicious and ambitious. They weren't kidding when they said, beware that witch. But you'll find that nowadays, I've mended all my ways, repented, seen the Lumos, made a switch. True, yes. <laughs> and I fortunately know a lot of magic. It's a talent that I always have possessed. And at Hogwarts, please don't laugh, I use it on behalf of the Ministry and all that they suggest. You're welcome. Unfortunate souls in pain, in need. This one craving better teachers, that one wants a pure blood world, and do I help them? Yes, indeed. Those poor unfortunate souls, so sad, so true. They come flocking to my office crying, decrees, umbrage, please, and I help them. Yes, I do. Now it's happened once or twice, someone wasn't playing nice, and I'm afraid I had to rake them cross the coals. Yes, I've had the odd complaint, but on the whole, I've been a saint. To those poor unfortunate souls. <laughs> Professors here don't like a lot of blabber. We think a boy who talks back is the worst. In my class, it's much preferred for students not to say a word. And if you lie, dear, you may find that you get cursed. Come on, I'm not all that impressed with your handwriting. Be sure to pay attention to your vowels. As you cut and clean and play, learn the lesson for today. It's he who holds his tongue who passes owls. Come on, you poor unfortunate soul. I'm in charge. You're a jerk. I'm a very busy woman, and I haven't got all day. You deserve this. Get to work, you poor unfortunate soul. It's sad but true. If you want to cross a boss, my sweet, it's bound to take a toll. Get a clue and get a grip and use my quill to sign the scroll. I am just so good at punishment and there is no Greetings, folks. <laughs> All right. Welcome, 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 students. My name is Dr. Brent Satterley, and I tell you, being in drag all day, waiting to go on at four freaking o'clock <laughs> is exhausting. I had to walk like five miles to a gender-inclusive bathroom, and you should have seen me. I actually had to go to the bathroom. So trying to, yeah, let's just say TMI. All right, let's get started. What's your tribe? Are there Slytherins in the house? Woo! Gryffindors! Woo! Hufflepuffs! Woo! And the, the Ravenclaws! Woo! All right, so today what we're gonna talk about is pathological tribalism. And I wanna be sure that you all know that we all are a tribe. What is a tribe? It's something that we belong to that gives us group solidarity, group identity. Eric Erickson says, in young adulthood, one of the most important psychosocial crises is between identity versus isolation. And it's a really important part. And it's one of the great things about this conference and the Harry Potter fandom, because often it saves lives. I know it did with mine. Uh, my um, husband had a heart attack about three years ago, and it was one of the most scariest things of my whole life. And I remember trying to find something that I would feel a part of and I could cling to that would give me hope, and it was Harry Potter. Uh, and it was such a powerful thing, so I want to acknowledge that. So, you met Senior Undersecretary Dolores Umbridge. And apparently she was bashed in the last session for being a horrible teacher. I was shocked. I stood there and stared. Whew. 
I know where you live. <laughs> I really don't, sorry. That's creepy. Uh, her history really set the stage for her hatred and prejudice. Um, she actually was the eldest child, all this from Pottermore, uh, the daughter of Orford Umbridge, a wizard, and Ellen Cracknell, a muggle, who also had a squib son. So she wasn't a pureblood. And she was actually, uh, not, she actually, she was not a pureblood. And she joined the Ministry of Magic as she got older and left Hogwarts, taking a job as an intern there. She slowly rose above the ranks and ended up being able to move into the head of the office uh, that promoted and quickly rose to a senior position uh, at the management of the Department of uh, Magic. She then moved to, uh, she then moved to Hogwarts and she was promoted ultimately as High Inquisitor. And her prejudices there grew. Her cruelty there grew. And it really came to full fruition. I'm a social worker. One of the things we know is that people's histories matter. People's childhoods and adulthoods, attachments, lived lives matter. Whether they have positive, loving people in their lives or they have traumas, matter. And by the way, the CDC recently, well, not recently, 2015, posted a study called the ACE study, that is, Adversive Childhood Experiences. And what they found was a lot more people actually had adversive childhood experiences like trauma or living in addiction or domestic violence than previously was thought. Uh, so those things matter. And it affects us. And it affected Dolores. Uh, she not only enjoyed, she didn't enjoy her time at school, she felt overlooked for previous positions, uh, and then she relished the chance to basically revenge. Uh, and that was a big part of what she wanted in that moment. So that's Dolores. I just wanted to give you a context. I use her as a teaching image. Yes, I teach in drag uh, in my university. Uh, and uh, go wider pride. Um, so tribalism, again, has to do with feeling connected to something greater than yourself, having a sense of solidarity. Yalom calls it, who's a group psychotherapist, calls it universality, normalization. I am not alone. As humans, we're social creatures. We often like to pair bond, feel connected to other folks. And that is one of the things that is part of what it means to be a tribe. But what it can sometimes do, as the previous plenary speaker spoke of, uh, to begin to engender an us versus them, an othering. Uh, you know, we're good, they're bad. We're rational, they're irrational. And we can see that in our political discourse today. And there are a number of things that contribute to that. Uh, there are two cognitive biases. One of those is what's called the two movie phenomena. That is, two people can go into one movie, Potterheads, and come out with completely different ideas or perceptions or anything of that nature, uh, and because they have a lens through which they see the world. Uh, and that's an important part. And we really saw a great example of that in the uh, last Supreme Court um, uh, approval uh, from Brett Kavanaugh and uh, the hearings and Dr. Christine Ford's testimony, that people across the country reacted completely differently, often because of either history, political ideologies, uh, perspectives, what have you, to movie phenomena. Another cognitive bias is what we call affect bias. Uh, don't she look great? I'm so proud of her. Uh, <laughs> feelings, uh, that feelings really drive your perception of things. Like, if you feel positively about something, uh, and then you generally judge the negatives and, the, and other people who believe positive about that thing, right? So, and if you feel negative about something, then you judge the negative highs and positives there. If you can manipulate feelings about a thing, you can manipulate thoughts about that thing. We know that from marketing, we know that from PR, we know that from all the kinds of ways that people interact with data points in the world. When, I mean, that's what commercials are about. I used to see that old Folgers commercial about Peter on Christmas morning who came home from the service and, uh, and the, the, he made coffee and it woke mom up and she came down and she said, Peter, just like that. And I'm like, you know, like the, the, that is manipulation. 
clearly. <clears throat> cultural cognition. Oh, sorry, that, that's pretty small. Um, so cultural cognition has to do with cultural values, the values we have about certain cultural issues. And of course, that invokes the culture wars. Uh, uh, marriage equality, abortion, reproductive rights, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, uh, you know, all, all the immigration, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. That, that can inflame people's perspectives, and they can become entangled and extreme. And this, those two cognitive biases coupled with a polarized environment, that is us versus them, when polarization increases, we're good, you're bad, common ground decreases. And the idea of that experience is considerable. And we see that here in group solidarity, uh, that it's, it feeds out group animosity. People who aren't part of our group are different. And different often equals bad. And we're often afraid of bad. And so how do we respond? Violently. And we see that on the political landscape and the national landscape and internationally every single day. Uh, and obviously, we can draw links to that experience in the Potterverse. Uh, and like even just um, the differences between er in the early books, uh, although the movies are good too, uh, you know, <laughs> early books uh, between uh, Gryffindor House's perspective and Slytherin House's perspective and how they sometimes would really battle each other and all those kinds of things. Just an example uh, how different perspectives can be engendered uh, by all of those pieces. Um, our blessed homeland, our glorious leader, our great religion, our noble populace, their barbarous wastes, their wicked despots, their primitive superstitions. This isn't new stuff. It's just that now we're seeing it a lot more because of the social media and information age. And it's affecting a lot of people and families. But the problem isn't tribalism. It's about the combination of tribalism, those cognitive biases, and a polarized environment. And it creates a toxic environment of pathological tribalism that often can lead to all kinds of different effects. And they're damaging. The first one is called reactive devaluation. That is, once we discover it was the other side who came up or supported something, all of a sudden we hate it. Right? Uh, and a great example of that was there was a high school valedictorian who talked about, he gave a quote and said, don't just get involved, fight for your seat at the table. Better yet, fight for a seat at the head of the table. And he attributed it to uh, uh, Donald Trump. And a lot of people were like, Aah! Then he was like, oh, well, I'm sorry, that was actually President Barack Obama. And it, it was like, Aah! you know, and that's called reactive devaluation. Right? If we think someone is uh, supporting something that we don't like, then we don't like that at all. The second is called crystallization. That is, we freeze people in time. I'm a family therapist. I have been for 25 years. And I can't tell you how many times people come in to see me saying, Uncle Jim got drunk at Christmas dinner and was really nasty to mom like seven years ago. And we never talked talk to him or see him at all. Except he's been in recovery for five years. And we don't allow him to grow and change or be different. Uh, and that's a big part of at least my, my, my perspective as a social worker uh, is that people have the capacity to grow and change. And that's really hard if someone has hurt us. And that's really hard if someone has hurt us. Uh, that is hard for us to think about what forgiveness might look like. Now, am I saying forgiveness is approving or saying that someone's hurting you or bad behavior is okay? Absolutely not. I'm saying forgiveness is a gift to yourself to let go of resentment and bitterness. Being anger is exhausting. It's exhausting. And that's a big part of it. Crystallization. Finally, uh, othering, which was actually talked about before. That is the practice of embracing an identity for oneself, ourselves, that is pred predicated upon the creation and manipulation and maneuvering of the other. Uh, the other group, that is us versus them, we are going to identify ourselves by not us. This is a classic those people conversations. 
right? Uh, and uh, that's uh, absolutely an experience. Uh, and a great example of this was Dumbledore's army versus the Inquisitorial Squad. They were two, I, you can bet that the people in the Inquisitorial Squad thought they were doing awesome stuff for the school, right? And, and Dumbledore's army thought the same. So what does it do to families and houses? Well, there's often historical conflict, and I'm going to go through this because I'm running out of time. Uh, there, uh, time turner, please. Uh, there are many reasons why families end up having acrimonious relationships as, child, as children reach adulthood. Uh, from difficult childhood environments, destructive parenting practices, trauma, difficult sibling rivalries, uh, et cetera, et cetera, these create a foundation. And then you add to it pathological tribalism influences, such as persuasion technologies, campaigns, geopolitics, commerce advertising, 24-7 connection, digital media. And then we get this sense of pathological tribalism and polarization that becomes toxic and poison to families. And what happens is people cut other people off. Literally, people walk out of each other's life. Family therapist uh, Bowen identifies it as the emotional cutoff. Uh, and where people actually leave to find like-minded folks and all of a sudden feel a great sense of relief. And in the short term, what that does is it gives a sense of elation and fervor. We're, we're common ground with these folks. We're part of it. And you've probably seen it at political rallies. It can get violent, toxic. It can become groupthink, all kinds of things. It can create confusion and numbness. And, uh, you know, a great example is but my mom didn't want me to come back this year. I don't do Scottish. Uh, so and long term, of course, and I'll be quick, as individuals, um, uh, they, people have selective perception, in, inattention, dissociation. They split themselves, guilt. Uh, people, uh, memory is reconstructive. People can actually change in their minds what actually happened through memory. Uh, it's, what, it's what we often do in narrative therapy called reauthoring, trauma. In families, the proliferation of uh, secrets, the conspiracy of silence, familial isolation, and transgenerational pain. And of course, in houses and in communities, polarization, uh, silence, submission, scapegoating, externalization, and violence towards others. In light of our time, I'll pass through this, but I, the, one of the pieces that is really important, I think, to understand is Dolores Umbridge represents systemic oppression. Like that people have, she has power to come in and affect people on the micro level. I'm going to bring Harry into the office and literally torture him, right? Versus the decrees that she issues uh, on an ongoing basis that will affect and horrifically the entire uh, community of Hogwarts. Don't be Dolores. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat>